Hello and welcome to this evening's webinar, How Dialectical Behavior Therapy and Art Therapy Can Generate Important Behavioral Insights. Our presenter today is Tanya Stearns. Tanya is a mental health therapy coordinator at Thera Health, where she supervises the art therapy program for patients. She is a licensed mental health counselor as well as a registered art therapist. Thera Health is a mental health facility in downtown Bellevue that specializes in partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs for women, teen girls, and female aligned individuals. Thera's treatment programs are grounded in a foundation of dialectical behavior therapy, which is a well-researched and highly effective treatment for those who are at a high risk of suicide, engage in self-harm, or suffer from other complex problems such as eating disorders, anxiety, depression, and more. For more information about Thera Health and its treatment options, please visit www.therahealth.com. A few bookkeeping notes. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Thera Health website in a few days. You will receive an email with a link to the recording when it's available. During the presentation, all audience microphones will be muted and cameras will be turned off. At the conclusion of the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your question. You may submit questions at any time, but all will be held until the end of the presentation. We will try to answer as many as we can in the time allotted. Thank you again for your interest in today's presentation and I'll turn it over to Tanya. Thank you for that introduction, David, and welcome to everybody else. I'm really excited to be given this opportunity to talk about two of my great loves, DBT and art therapy. Both I find to be extremely dynamic, immersive, and effective treatment modalities that I have experienced as powerful conduits of change and growth. And that I'm really excited to be talking about more with all of you today. So a little overview of what will, what will be covered today. Um, we will be talking about DBT and art therapy as they are delivered in a mental health setting. We will be talking through how the art making process can really reinforce DBT concepts on a variety of different levels and through all four DBT modules. And then really the bread and butter of this presentation and where I find a lot of my own bliss with the work that I do is viewing art examples that have been collected over the past few years here at Thera, both from teen and adult patients that really can highlight and reinforce the merging of these two modalities in a really beautiful way and in a really visual way. So with that, We'll start off with a little overview of what is DBT? What is dialectical behavioral therapy? This is a therapy that has really picked up speed in recent years and has really spread and is being utilized in a lot of different ways. I think the emergence between DBT and art therapy is maybe less known and less explored. So again, being given the opportunity to highlight my experience of how the two can really blend together is something I'm really excited to do. So starting with a little overview, that first word of dialectical behavioral therapy, dialectical, refers to finding a synthesis or an integration, finding that middle path, that middle ground between two actual or seeming opposites. This can come up in a lot of different ways. You'll, most people will notice DBT therapists over enunciate the word and because instead of utilizing the word but or or, we link together opposing or seemingly opposing statements with and. So both can be true when we're looking at opposites. We can be scared of change and be motivated for it. We can be totally exhausted with the virtual platform of our day and age today and still be glad that it is a way to deliver information and knowledge and experience to those who need it all over the world or those who want it. For me, one of my strongest dialectics is that I'm an artist. I often think visually, I really believe in the power of expression and creative expression especially. And I'm a clinician that thrives on data and variables and logic and have really seen how the rationale side of things, that logic-minded side of things can benefit. Being able to find the synthesis between those two sides has really formulated who I am as a clinician. And I think a really beautiful example of dialectics overall. DBT also focuses on acceptance and validation of behaviors as they occur. So this is paramount to meeting patients or clients where they're at. 
there is so much judgment and so much shame that can come out of any number of behaviors, especially the self-destructive ones or the ones that are really not serving someone well. If we can focus on accepting behaviors, accepting emotions as they are in the moment and reduce that judgment, it can really allow for a space to move forward and to make long lasting change for those behaviors, as opposed to getting mired in that negative space around them and that self-defeating space around them. The DBT model is also really grounded in a skills-based approach. So we use these four different modules based in DBT to teach skills to our clients, to our patients, and really offer them, empower them, that they are the masters of their own change. Those skills are based around four main modules, as I mentioned, distress tolerance, so kind of inherent in the name itself, but really allows for skills to decrease our distress in any given moment. When we're in crisis, when we're feeling emotionally dysregulated, skills that can lower our heart rate, that can allow the intensity of our body that is experiencing anxiety to come down, to regulate our breathing. Being able to take us back into a space where we can engage more readily with other skills so we are able to move forward with effective change. The second one is emotional regulation. That is really about long-term shaping of not only understanding our emotions, but also learning how to change the intensity of the emotion ourselves. Our interpretations, right? That thought that because I feel something, it must be so, isn't always the most accurate or the most effective approach. Our emotions are valid because we're feeling them. How do they fit the facts of the situation? Does the intensity of the emotion we're experiencing fit the facts of the situation? Being able to short and long-term gain the skills to regulate that emotional space can be a really powerful tool. The third is interpersonal effectiveness. So that's really empowering those who are learning those skills to engage more mindfully, more effectively, not only with themselves in levels of assertiveness, of setting limits with themselves and with other people, of saying no, but also learning how to validate others, to maintain a sense of self while still being a highly empathetic person, dialectics sneaking here and again really improving overall the way that we can engage with our social world and learn how to advocate for ourselves. And that fourth module, which you'll see as I go into the art therapy portion later in this talk, mindfulness is probably one of the bigger components of where we see that overlap occur. Mindfulness can be applied in so many different ways. It's mindfulness of our emotions. It's mindfulness of our current space. Mindfulness of the function of our behaviors, of the controlling variables around them, of the threat of acting on a behavior or not acting on a behavior. Mindfulness of breath, of being able to be present with ourselves. I'll talk a little bit more in a little bit about some of where that, those mindfulness approaches come from and how they really mesh well with some creative modalities. So DBT in practice, especially in our space here at Thera and in mental health settings in general. So it is the therapist that really acts in that space to help bring things together that again appear to be opposites. So some of the most common examples we'll see here and you'll see some art examples later on that really highlight this can be that dialectical space between loving someone and at the same time recognizing that the relationship with this person is also blocking one's own personal growth. Another dialectic could be feeling simply too exhausted to show up for one more therapy session and showing up anyway. Or it could be one of my favorite dialectics that comes up all the time in both my personal and professional life is that dialectic between acceptance and change. How do we look at the events in our lives, the things that are happening to us and determine what is actually within our capacity to change and what do we lean more toward acceptance with. So often we expend so much energy 
towards changing things that are not in our capacity to change, either because they've happened in the past or they're contingent on other people who we don't have control over. If we can move toward that acceptance, all that energy that we've used to try to change the unmovable then can be utilized toward towards the aspect where change is actually applicable, which is our own emotional state, our own emotional understanding. And again, that's where that really profound long-term and lasting change can come from. So this is another example of a dialectic navigating a significant loss. A lot of the patients we see here are experiencing loss are in a state of grieving for one occurrence or another, from a failed relationship, from a death, from the end of a dream, or this is again really common, grieving sense of self as they've always thought that they are. If a core concept of self is suddenly being challenged because they're realizing a way they've always seen themselves is actually not serving them well, there's a lot of grief that comes with that. So that acceptance piece is always really important there. There's a lot of grief that is inherent in acceptance. I kind of mentioned on this one already, but that idea of wanting to stop a self-destructive behavior while also believing you are not capable of doing so, or alternatively, that doing so would mean losing a huge part of yourself, feels so incongruent to who you are that the mere thought of actually changing that behavior can freeze people up and how terrifying it can feel. And that's something that is so genuine and again, a lot, really inherent in a lot of the people we treat here. And I have some really beautiful examples of that in the art that I'll be showing in a little bit. DBT really encouraging adopting a non-judgmental stance, both with ourselves and with others, is highly important. One thing I always say is I feel like in some ways we are all inherently we are people that inherently can have judgments, that do have judgments. It is judging our judgments that can be really problematic. So adopting that non-judgmental stance is also paired with a mindfulness approach of acknowledging judgments as they occur. And that practice sort of watching them go by, recognizing that we can have a judgment without acting on it or without it being detrimental to ourselves or to others. So really encouraging adopting that non-judgmental stance, again, both with ourselves and with other people. So DBT is really a beautiful blend of Eastern and Western modes of therapy. It's partly based, especially those mindfulness components, um, Eastern traditions of Zen Buddhism, especially, uh, or Zen practices, I should say, of imagery, metaphor, meditation, all those things can really help encourage that mindful space of being able to focus on breath, step outside of oneself as an objective observer, so we can reinforce taking on that non-judgmental stance. These are all practices that we turn back to again and again, both with ourselves as treatment providers and with our clients, with our patients. We can focus on our presence of mind as it is in that moment, as opposed to what do we want it to be. We can focus on the event of something that is happening as it's occurring, as opposed to our potentially distorted interpretation of it. Interpretations of situations or events around us can be highly colored by both our emotional experience or our logic mind over rationalizing an experience. If we can take it back to that practice of being mindful and grounded in that present moment, perhaps we can regain awareness of things happening as they are and not as we want them to be, which can increase understanding of our own responses to those events, to those prompts overall. So this speaks to a little bit more about how DBT focuses on how we take things in, how we learn, how we interpret, and how behaviors are really shaped throughout our lifetimes. The change comes from encouraging, facilitating people to learn new ways of coping through those skills modules, through mindfulness approaches, to really make them feel empowered that they are capable of change and that the change comes from them. We help 
lay the groundwork. We help facilitate that learning. And really the change comes from their own experience of it and their own adoption of the skills. DBT focusing on specific goals that can realistically be attained is something that is also very much a crux of the work that we do here. Now, this will often come back with this, come back to this concept of a life worth living goal is something that we utilize a lot. This idea of what is it for you that makes your life worthy of being lived. It is because it is such a skills-based, skills-oriented, individual program, it is really up to the recipient, up to the client, up to the patient to take on why they want to go through all of that work. What is the goal for them that they're going to apply all these skills so they can get there? Different for everybody. For a lot of our youngins, it is sometimes they just want to get out of their house so they can be free and go to college. For some of our adults, it may be a vocation they've always been interested in or being able to return to a hobby of something that they always enjoyed when they were younger. Really orienting people toward what are the specific goals for that person and then implementing action steps, graspable, accessible action steps that they can move toward those goals as they're learning skills to be able to do so. DBT really emphasizes making change through practicing of those skills to change how you think, act, and feel. So what does that mean? So through practicing of skills, in our program here at Thera, they have DBT groups every day, skills group learning those skills. And then they are given homework every day to take those skills that they learn and take them out into their worlds and generalize them, apply them in a real life way so it gives context to things that they may be learning in a classroom setting, right? In this therapy classroom setting and out of a book. They need to practice, practice, practice like we all do until hopefully the intent being the skills become more like muscle memory. And they could be in a situation that feels cueing or their emotional intensity is rising and they can grasp onto the skills in a way that they might have not had access to do so before. And in the long term, it really can have effective change on how we think, act, respond, feel in an, any number of situations. DBT is much more of a doing rather than a talking therapy, as has probably been evident as I've been sort of talking through some of these concepts. It is problem solving oriented, is action oriented. It is not a processing therapy. It is skills based, and again, that empowerment of sitting in our emotions just for the sake of sitting them in them. It's not gonna be effective overall. Being mindful and identifying our emotions and then working from that space, that's where that effectiveness is gonna be. So putting that action into the therapy work. So that kind of lands, I mean, we could talk about DBT for a long time, but that's a little synopsis on general DBT approaches as they will be blending with our therapy approaches a little bit later on here. Next, we will move to what is art therapy? This is something I could also talk about all day, but I'm gonna kind of review the same general concepts and the similar types of way that I did for DBT. So art therapy is a form of psychotherapy that uses art media as its primary mode of expression and communication. Something that is very important here, and I'll probably say a couple of times because it's kind of a passion point of mine, art therapy is a legitimized type of therapy. It is not in our class. Art therapists are not art teachers. They are trained clinicians that utilize expressive modalities as, like I like to say, their secret weapon. We have another magical tool in our toolkit to be able to meet people where they're at in a different way, in a non-verbal way. Verbalizing the experience with the art making is certainly a part of it. But sometimes there may be people as well that are non-verbal because of a trauma they went through or because they've talked about their experiences up and down and sideways and they don't know how else to talk about it. But being able to express themselves creatively can give them new avenues of understanding into things they may have felt have been talked out already. 
It is a way for people to really dive inward into their thoughts and into their emotions by any sorts of media that they would like to or that can be applicable. I'll talk a little bit more about how some media is more effective in certain presentations than others. But really, I've seen art therapy be powerful with painting, with drawing, with ceramics, with fabric making. Um, our teenagers here especially are huge on collaging. There are so many different modalities. My own personal backgrounds in photography and integrating photography ideas and concepts into art therapy work has been something that has been really profound and really powerful. I kind of already mentioned this part, but just like I warned would be reiterated. So it is a mental health profession and it's employed in many clinical settings with diverse populations. It is still a fairly new field. Art therapy really has been around 60 years or so in going on 70 years in a really formalized kind of way. And it's starting to pick up steam more and more. You're seeing this integrated into being used with different populations in different healthcare settings all over the country, all over the world. There is so much opportunity for that idea of creative expression being a powerful tool, a powerful therapeutic tool. It is really rooted in that idea as well that just the act of creative expression can foster healing and well being. Whether one identifies themselves as an artist or not, that act of getting something down on a page, of shaping something with one's hand, linking it back to mindfulness, of bringing ourselves back into the current moment, that in and of itself can foster that sense of well being. And there's so much more inherent in the creative process that can help encourage that space of self-recognition, of increased self-awareness, of healing in a way that can feel safer than exposing ourselves in a really verbal or pressured way, which oftentimes patients, clients can experience. The page itself can be a holding place for a lot of emotion, a lot of pain, a lot of experience. And that, again, can really encourage a lot of powerful healing. Benefits of art therapy in general, all across the board. I have worked with clients as young as four. And for me personally, up until early 70s, I have some colleagues and friends who work with people in memory care facilities, geriatric populations um, with expressive healing and expressive arts. In hospital settings, it's another area I've done art therapy in. And again, that's an area, well, what if they are nonverbal because they've been in some type of accident or experienced a stroke? Losing that capacity to speak, they can then have another mode of expression and another avenue toward healing. They can explore their feelings, they can reconcile emotional conflicts, kind of mentioned already the fostering of that self-awareness, developing social skills. This is something I see all the time in our setting here at Thera. Most of our art therapy experiences are in a group setting. And whether it's adults, whether it's teens, that experience of sitting with a group of other people in creating can be a really profound one. I can't even tell you how many times people will come into an art space and they say, I'm not an artist. I'm, I suck at art. I'm not going to be good at this. And that's honestly one of my favorite moments. I love it when people say that to me. So I'm like, ooh, give me a one week. Give me even sometimes one session. Because it isn't about how good it is. We can all be artists in the sense of creative expression without worrying so much about the product. And I'll speak a little more to that. Improving reality orientation. That experience of sometimes we create something like that idea of this is my interpretation, so it must be so. Creating it in an art piece, sometimes by visually seeing the distortion of it or by the art therapist providing an intervention that changes the perspective a little bit can really help encourage that patient who created that piece to be like, huh, okay, maybe I need to actually look at this differently and see this differently. 
reducing anxiety, increase, increasing self-esteem, that idea of building mastery, a very important DBT concept to not only give one a sense of accomplishment, but to give one a sense of control in a world where so often they can feel like there's so much out of our control. Taking it back to cause and effect of I can put pen to paper and create something can really aid in that facilitation of that building mastery, reducing anxiety. One of my favorite mindfulness, brief mindfulness activities that I will do with people in line with anxiety reduction is drawing one's own breath putting pen to paper and just focusing on breath and seeing how the pen moves. There's so many examples of these kind of interventions that can be utilized that really help facilitate this. Art therapists, and I'll say again, they are trained in both art and therapy. They are licensed healers, they are licensed counselors, and they have that magic toolbox of also being able to provide these interventions that allow for a different avenue of expression, a different avenue of healing. I mentioned this, so I won't reiterate it, but it's not an art class. Now that certainly doesn't mean, you know, I've had clients or patients come up to me and ask like, hey, what is like, how do we perfectly divide a face so it looks realistic? Like what are the proportions? I'm gonna offer some feedback there. I'm trained in those areas. However, it is, not about the goodness of how well something is created, it is about the process of it itself. It is very much grounded, there's a lot of art therapy concepts that are grounded in a knowledge of human development, of psychological theories, and of counseling techniques. So this comes really from a variety of different backgrounds and perspectives. There is Eric, Erickson's stages of development. So looking at the art that someone creates and an art therapist can look at that and determine, interpret their developmental stage that they're at based on how it's composed, based on line quality, based on so much more than what just the image is itself, but all the various different components for it. There's so many other examples of that where we've, art therapy has pulled from well-established modes of therapy, of counseling, of development, and integrated it into art therapy approaches. I won't speak too much more about this, but in general, there's so many different techniques that can be used in art therapy. Really any sort of creative modality, I've seen people get so creative with the various things that they want to use. I mentioned that our teens here at the Era love collage. One of the things I love about that is that aspect of Sometimes the blank page staring at us can feel really overwhelming, right? The metaphor of how do we take that first step? Want to create something, want to make effective change, but I don't know how to get that first foot out. Utilizing something like collage, they can pull from images that are already produced and make something from that. We're inherently going to pull or feel the pull toward images that speak to us for one reason or another. And I can't even tell you how many times I've seen that occur. The collage comes out and they look at it and they have a sense of pride or at the very least a sense of profound, like, whew, that was something. And then it starts flowing. And what I mean by it is that the art might start flowing, but it can also translate to other areas in their life of, oh, it can feel impossible or overwhelming to take that first step and I can't do it. And they do it. So oftentimes when people are stuck in more traditional forms of therapy. I will have them utilize something like collage or a squiggle drawing, which I have some very cool examples of as well, to kind of get that flow started for themselves, to worry less on what they're creating, less on what the end goal is, and to just get movement towards goals started. Coloring is something that's also been really big in therapy settings. We see it all the time with our patients here. Um, most of you probably remember a few years ago, there was quite a big adult coloring phase that can be really helpful in something that feels more controlled, something that can allow for that focus of attention if things are going to feel chaotic and out of control. Things like finger painting are going to be the opposite. 
finger painting can be amazing. I mean, it takes us back to when we were children, or at least it does for me, but it can also be quite dysregulating for people. Getting paint, getting messy, you know, all over our hands and then smearing it can be wonderful. However, if someone's already experiencing a high state of dysregulation, it might not be the best modality to be using in that moment, the best media might offer them something more like pen or pencil coloring, something that's gonna pull it a little more to a grounded control. So just a few examples of those different media that we can use. So I've already linked a few of these together, a kind of these concepts of art therapy and DBT. And now we're really gonna go into the crux of it and talk about how a lot of the concepts I've already mentioned are going to be reinforced with each other. So making art in itself supports a lot of the DBT tenets of facilitating development of coping skills in nonverbal ways. So I've mentioned building mastery. There's a lot of emotional regulation that can come up. Those pieces I was sort of already talking about of dysregulation, okay, doing an art piece that feels more controlled or the opposite. I feel so tight in the need to be perfect, to supply an art directive that is gonna open one up what is that opposite action to perfectionism? We don't even necessarily have to put words to it. The art therapist and an art therapist who has DBT knowledge too can be a little sly and a little sneaky. Like, oh, I'm seeing that you keep crumpling up every piece of artwork you're creating. Okay, I'm gonna slide a piece of paper in front of them and have them draw with their non-dominant hand. I'm gonna have them do a blind contour drawing, drawing something without looking down at their page. Removes an element of control that it's not gonna be perfect, it can't be. And yet it can be playful, it can still be beautiful, it can still be dynamic. And that can really open up that space, release some of that need for control and that need to be perfect and get them moving again. There's a couple of the ways that a lot of the art therapy directives and tenants can support those DBT approaches as well. Coping skills can help patients. As I've mentioned, I think just the inherent process of art making is grounding, is self-soothing. I mean, looking at this picture here even of a sculpture, imagining having your hands around a bowl and as it's moving, hearing the spin of the wheel, feeling that grip beneath one's hands, all of those, it's like utilizing the five senses to be grounded in the current moment. It can be a very powerful tool to be grounding and to be self-soothing can help identify important emotions. I have some art examples I will show you of emotional advertisements, for example. Let's look at our emotions in a little bit different way. Let's see how we can understand them in a different way, interpret them differently, because there's more than one ways to see something. To implement grounding techniques, I touched on that a little bit already, to ground ourselves in the current moment, whether that be through sculpting or drawing or painting or whatever it may be. Utilizing self-regulation strategies. So this is really big. I kind of already mentioned that sometimes see a lot of frustration coming up in art spaces. If we have the need to create something and it's not coming out in the way that we want, do we crumple it? Do we push it to the side? Do we start to get flooded with self-judgmental or self-defeating thoughts? Okay, can we utilize then that art space to go back to it, to adopt that non-judgmental stance, to do or try a new approach that's gonna increase our frustration tolerance and help with that self-regulation. And again, the art therapist is paramount there in helping witness by observation that this may be occurring and stepping in with some directives, with some interventions. A little bit of a deeper dive into some of these concepts. So the exploration of meaning and metaphor is something I've touched on already. How meanings relate to a patient's emotional state. There's so much meaning, so much metaphor, so much imagery that's inherent in art making. And that is also utilized in DBT in mindfulness approaches particularly, but in general. And how can we see what is interpreted through an art piece, what is on the page? How is that reflecting where a patient's emotional state at, is at? Some very kind of common examples if you know, a patient is like, yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling really happy today. And they create a piece that is very dark and has a lot of blues, we might look at that and like, mm, getting a feel from this with the color choice and the things that you're using, that maybe there's a little more 
understanding of could there be some sadness there? Do we need to dive a little bit deeper and assess if there's some more nuance to how you were feeling in that moment? Emotion regulation, to ex the ability to exert control over our emotional state. That Again, that concept that we have more control, it is in fact, one of the only things we do have control over is our own emotional state. Involving barriers, excuse me, behaviors such as rethinking challenging situations to reduce our anxiety or our anger, to focus, to increasing focus, to feel happy and calm. All of these can come up in the art therapy process. Radical acceptance being a huge one. That idea of radical acceptance is to accept something, is to stop fighting it and stop responding with impulsive and destructive behaviors out of that difficulty to accept something as is. One of the most important accept or parts of radical acceptance is that acceptance does not mean approval and it does not mean being complacent. It is accepting something as is and being able to move forward with change from that point. Advantages of art therapy can connect patients to their experience through nonverbal expressions. It is creativity is not forced through potential censorship from the verbal judging mind. It is what it is. Anything is allowed on the page, as I say. And helps generate problem solving skills via that art making process, which I've already touched on. Allowing for that increased frustration tolerance. Oz already spoke to that, but it can be really, really big in that art space. So now that I've kind of verbally gone through both DBT art therapy and where they kind of blend together, I'm gonna to bring a lot of these concepts to life by showing you some art examples, again, collected by adolescents and adults from my time as an art therapist here at Thera with all identifying information removed, but I will speak a little bit about the DBT concepts inherent in some of these pieces. I wanted to start with this one because this is such a beautiful example of dialectics showing up in art. This is an intervention I would do of providing a template of a Venn diagram or having patients kind of create their own and having them think on a meaningful dialectic in their life and how that is represented, how it shows up for them. Even in something that is seemingly as simple as what you see here, which is mostly about color and shape, there is profound meaning behind this. This was an adult patient who had recently gone through a painful breakup of a relationship. And how she described this is, you see on one side, these colors of love, this heart. And on the other is these colors of, you know, blue sadness kind of introspection. And the overlap, the middle ground between the two, the synthesis, was this explosion of color for her with almost this like third eye coming out where she was experiencing a renewed sense of growth and healing and a lot of new insights about herself. So even with something that is more abstract in nature, again, there was a lot of profound meaning in this for her. Here's another example of dialectics shown in art. This was one of our teenagers um, around 15, I believe. And this was the, how she chose to represent her dialectic was identification of self. So you see the, kind of the back side of her and on one side, this bright sky, these birds flying by overhead, this big flower, this color, this richness. And on the other side, you see depression knocking on the door, looming above her. And even this other smaller figure that's cowering under the weight of that and there's, it's devoid of color. And this is really how she experienced her life a lot of the time was this split between this pull toward a normative adolescent experience, a normative life, and this other side where depression just felt all encompassing and just threatened to squash her under the weight of it. I thought it was a very powerful example of that kind of dialectical experience. Here we have, I mentioned previously, an example of a squiggle drawing. I love doing these directives so much. This is a bigger piece of paper, it's about 16 by 20. And as I mentioned previously, this is a really great directive to offer when someone is feeling stuck in perfectionism or the need to control. If they're able to move their bodies and really create, I have them either close their eyes or draw with their non-dominant hand and just squiggle until they feel like their squiggle is done. 
they open their eyes or they look down and then they rotate the image until they can see something formulating. So here we have a bunch of abstract faces, but it's that idea of relinquishing control, doing opposite action to perfectionism and still creating, still being able to move. I find that doing it on a larger paper is effective as well because it allows people to move their bodies and flow more into the process as well. Here's another example of that kind of more intense scribble as you would. You can see, I think the original scribble, I think you can see underneath it was quite light. And then they actually drew on top of it this sort of explosion with this darker, heavier media, I believe it might have even been charcoal or crayon. And then what they added to it was putting this figure right in the middle. And this was a young adult, 22, who mentioned this is often how she felt as well, right? It's a very powerful example of how it can feel to be in this chaos of pain, of sadness, and yet feel like it's exploding out of you, like being stuck in it and it's exploding out of you at the same time. And again, this was something that she did not think set off to create, but by doing that scribble, it just inherently came. Allows for increased understanding of how she was feeling in that moment. And here's one last one of that scribble drawing, a self-portrait. So this was one of those clients, um, again, a teenager who came in and was just expressing over and over how she didn't like art, she wasn't good at it did a squiggle drawing and this was, she was so proud of this image. It was a self portrait that came out that was a little abstract, a little bizarre and still so emotive, so powerful. And she looked at it and she was in, I could see the buy-in and she kept showing up and she kept making art. Here's an example of where media can really be powerful, the choice of media. This is a directive I do where it's less about, it's not at all about the product and it's about what tools we use. So this is watercolor on paper. You can see there's tape around the paper. It's taped down. And then I encourage the patients to get the paper very, very wet and put watercolor onto it and just let the experience of the paint occur and to build off of that. It's very difficult to control watercolor. So again, reading the room, reading the patient of where they're at, and if they need something control, we may shift. However, this allowed for this patient to create, again, another self-portrait because it created this very cool sort of corally effect and it was bleeding into the middle and they were able to add a little more with their watercolor and create a portrait of themselves. These were some of my favorite directives I've done. These are emotional advertisements. So in line with DBT concepts of mindfulness of emotions and emotion regulation, it's identifying our current emotional state. So you see a little piece of paper here. Actually, what we had, do, we, what we had people do with this one is write down an emotion and then put it into a bowl and pick out a random one to encourage people, to encourage the patients to think about emotions in a different way to check in, I was like, hmm, if I was gonna advertise this emotion, if I was going to describe it in an expressive way, what would that look like? So here you see shame. You can see this thread that's threatened to be cut and all of, I won't read them all out loud, but all of these sort of distorted thoughts that can come up, really encouraging identification as, of emotions as they are with that stance of non-judgment. And it can be a playful way to do this, right? Making an advertisement for our emotion. Here's another one I've always really loved. This was a adolescent patient, again, 13 years old. Um, the experience, this emotional advertisement of fear. I could also see this being, very much being anxiety, but that idea of peeking around a corner, we always have to check corners. We always have to look behind our backs. I found it very clever, very dynamic, even in its simplicity. And here's another emotional advertisement of anxiety, right? That questioning, there's so many thoughts. You can see also in the top part of this head, there's these swirling lines that experiences of our thoughts just swirling around us all the time. The questions constantly floating through, life's a mess. Being able to facilitate that non-judgmental response to something that when we think about anxiety often, or we think about the experience of it can feel so disheartening, can feel so self-defeating that we can move away from it right away. 
this allows for space to lean into it, to explore it more in a way that hopefully feels more safe and more holding. This one was a idea based off of self-identification. So just really concepts of self. And I found this one to be so profound. She was, this was an adult patient, early twenties, talking about her experience of loneliness, um, which was very profound part of her experience while she was with us. So it is that really embodies that concept of being in a crowded room, all those spaces behind her, our heads looking at her, that idea of hypervigilance, everyone's staring at me and I can still feel so alone in a crowded room and turned away from it. There's that an experience of shame as well. And I wanted to include this one also because of its simplicity of it. It is so powerful, I think. This was a descriptor or a example of depression of sadness. And this again was a patient who was very willful about art making in general. And they were, I think, ended up using, they were quite angry and they were using their fingers at first and then the brush in a really angry manner and was kind of stabbing it down, creating these blotches. And out of that, they created this incredibly simple but incredibly powerful descriptor of like, this is how I feel when depression hits. And they were someone who didn't quite return to art making with the same like fever as some others, but they bought into it and they kept this piece, which I think was indicative as well. I wanted to include this piece because another thing that art therapy can do in more an individual setting is actually provide some, not just interventions, but some assessments. So the bird's nest assessment is something, and I actually did this in a group space, but it can be representative of how people are feeling in their home environment. So linking it back to DBT, oftentimes a lot of the patients that we treat come from a space of an invalidating environment, and they may not even fully grasp or understand the variables of that. Creating a bird's nest, and I don't tell them that it could be representative of a home environment beforehand, can really give indicators to give more signs of what that home environment is like for them. This patient, not all that surprisingly, even though I had to mention it, actually put a house inside their birdhouse that was floating around and sort of ungrounded. You can sort of see that space that they don't feel moored in their home environment at all. And I found that to be very interesting. This one has been always one of my favorites and links back to something I had mentioned previously of one of my favorite if not favorite dialectic, something that we see very commonly in our space here with the patients we treat, of that idea of being attached to self-defeating or self-destructive behaviors as core concepts of self, because maybe they've been reinforced of that's who we are or get our needs met by being that way, by highlighting our diagnoses. And yet at the same time, recognizing that these behaviors, that these feelings about identity, of wrapping our identity around depression and anxiety aren't serving us well. So this was a patient that was the dialectic, was that idea of core concept of self, of depression. You can see that she's almost feeling like she's losing her sense of self. It's just being washed through the page. And yet she's saying, don't leave me, I need it. And then there's also this, I'm sorry at the top of depression, of that feeling being like, I'm sorry, I'm staying, I'm still grasping. I found that to be such a powerful one. And it, this was an adolescent, 17 years old, that created this. You can see even sense of self in the way she drew her arm. It is just with a light pencil and there's no definition there. There's no atmosphere around her. There's no environment. We can look at all these things and really see, I think, the loss of sense of self. And yet there's still this attachment to it because it's what has been built, like her core concept of self has been built around it. And I wanna wrap up and leave you with a really beautiful example of, I won't read through this whole poem. If you have opportunity to do so, while well, it's up here on the screen, I encourage you to do, the, do so. This was an adult patient in her forties who created this piece at the end of Thera and made multiple copies and handed them out to everyone. And it was so beautiful. It is very much indicative of the change she went through, the empowerment she felt. You can see at the top, she labeled it my lioness song. And how this came to be in an art space was actually doing a shadow drawing of profiles. So 
having patients stand against a wall and trace their actual face profiles against a blank sheet of paper, and then filling in the space inside the head of what are their thoughts, what are their experiences, how they see themselves, or even how they feel others may see them. And this is what she created. And it is all about turning up her light and how profound the DBT and I think art therapy experience was for her. So I will leave you on that positive note. I will wrap the presentation. And at this point, I will open it up to questions. Tanya, thank you. That was really, really incredible. Very informative. Um, for the participants, if you move your mouse around, you'll see a menu appear at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can use the Q&A um, option there to ask your questions and we will get them to Tanya. You're very welcome. Um, we do, so the first questions come through, um, Tanya, how does art, how does group art therapy differ from individual art therapy? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So I kind of mentioned on a couple of aspects of it, there are a lot of similarities, but in individual art therapy, I think you have a lot more room to sort of experience, um, or experiment, excuse me, with some of those direct interventions and assessment protocols. It is more difficult to do so in a group setting. Um, what I mean by that, there are some more, um, one is like house tree person, it's called, having someone draw a house, a tree, and a person can really give a lot of signs and indicators to different states of their emotions and their experiences of how they feel safe in the world. Where in an art therapy group setting, it's really looking at what directives we can provide that are going to be approachable for as many people as possible without needing too much of that like direct one-on-one -on -one intervention, especially since the art groups are often, if they're an hour and we need a few minutes to set up and a few minutes to clean up and hopefully discuss, we may only have about 30 to 45 minutes of art making. And that can really limit what we um, engage with as far as directives as well. All right, we've actually got a bunch of other questions coming through. Let's try and get through them. So the first one uh, is, may I ask if you use sensory play for your therapy? Sensory play. If I'm understanding that correctly, you're speaking, and I know they can maybe not can answer, but uh, sensory play as far as focusing on like utilizing the senses and different media, different material. Absolutely. I think um, I mentioned a little bit about ceramics or like clay. That is a big component of it. We don't have those materials, although we do have some air dry clay here at Thera. Um, we can do some more sensory play as far as like fabrics, tissue papers, different materials like that. Um, that might be something that, again, is more effective on a one on one basis because it can really be about facilitating a mindfulness of approach and coaching someone through what they're experiencing through their senses. Although certainly elements of it are utilized in that group art therapy space as well. Excellent. Um, so let's see. So what do you do with individuals who don't want to do art in group therapy? <laughs> uh, they're, that they're afraid of a judgment. Yeah, so that's very common. I know I kind of like uh, set myself up there. So it's like one of my favorite things when someone comes in and say they are not an artist or they don't want to do art. There are so many different ways where someone can participate in the art making process and they, I, they don't have to share. So one of, I have two main approaches in the art therapy space, one of which is it's all allowed on the page. In our setting here, sometimes that can mean violent imagery, something that can mean cueing imagery, whether that be about suicidal or life-threatening behaviors. If they are expressing that on the page, I wanna encourage that expression and then I will just orient them, be mindful of who's sitting around you. We don't want it to be cueing for those that are also in this space. And then they don't have to speak or share it in the discussion portion. They can keep it to themselves. They're welcome to crumple it if that's something that they feel like they need to do. Um, there's a variety of different ways. I can usually get someone to engage in some form of art making, whether that be coloring. Again, collage is a really good place to start. Like, hey, why don't you just look through these images and see what jumps out to you? Finding some avenue for them to start engaging with the material. And sometimes it's a slower burn for some than it is for others. 
but they're that's one of the beauties of expressive modalities. There's so many different avenues that they can really get after various ones. Someone asked, can one effectively do art therapy through telehealth? Ooh, that's great question. question. Yeah. yeah, great question. Um, yes, although in my experience, it's extremely challenging. Um, I have been more effective in doing art therapy with clients or patients who are adults through telehealth. Um, it really needs to be very self-motivated. If they have, you know, they have to really get their own art supplies. They really have to, most of the times where I've seen it be effective is assigning the art therapy directive as homework. And then the therapy session is utilized more for discussion of the experience of the art making and of the art itself. For kids, for younger people, it is more challenging as is a lot of therapy modalities through telehealth. And it really takes the buy-in of caretakers, of the parents to you know, provide the materials to help encourage the making of the art between sessions. So that's the long answer, short answer. Yes, it's possible. And there are definitely some significant challenges to be met. All right, we have one from a, a social worker in a school setting who loved your ideas. And she's wondering what resources you would recommend uh, for some more ideas, a book, classes, a workbook, anything like that, some kind of a, you know, another yeah. resource? There are so many resources out there. Um, I would encourage you there, if you go to like the art, there's an art therapy association, national association. They have a lot of good resources listed there. If you're looking for convergence of art therapy and DBT, there is one book and I'm I'm so sorry, I'm blanking on the name right now, um, but I can maybe provide it and we can post it with the chat in some way. Um, but I believe it's just called Art Therapy and DBT. That is a, had some really good examples. There's an art therapy source book that's available. Um, I would recommend those to start, but going through that National Art Therapy Organization is, um, and you can just kind of Google that, is a really good jumping off spot because they will have a lot of links to different resources and um, avenues that you can get some more ideas with as well. Excellent. All right, I think we've covered all of the questions and we are just about out of time. Okay. So Tanya, again, thank you. I, that, was a, that was a really wonderful presentation. Everybody, as a reminder, if you're still on, um, this has been recorded in a few days, we will get it posted to the website and then we will get a link out um, to everyone who registered so that you can, if you want to get back and reread that poem or go through it, or if you want to share it uh, with somebody else, you know, you'll have a link to do that. So okay. thank you all. Thank you, Tanya, and enjoy the rest of this gorgeous evening. Thank you, everyone.